Hi everyone, this is George Tor coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there. My name is, guess, guess my friends, yes, Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It all depends when you are joining us. Let's look at the Torah portion that is read in the synagogues throughout the world and glean some relevant messages to our times right now, right here. We read on the lives and the times of our patriarch Abraham. He was considered the first Jewish person. Every incident in his life is significant and contains valuable insights for us, all of us, his descendants. What do we read? We read that Abraham planted an Ashel, a tree in Beersheba. These are the words. What can we learn from that? That so many thousands of years ago, Abraham built a tree in the desert. What's the importance of Arbor Day? That he was a uh, tree-hugging hippie? How can the environmentally friendly person who already uh, carpools, recycles, and refuses to shop at Home Depot or buy non-fair uh, trade coffee apply this teaching? It is known that Abraham was in the business of welcoming guests. He invited complete and total strangers to come into his tent, eat his food, drink his wine, and relax from their journey. So Abraham, number one, was a real mensch. It's, uh, it just so happened that he worked in the desert. Due to the tremendous lack of shade, he planted a tree. What better way to welcome a sweaty wayfarer than a well-shaded seat? As the saying goes, uh, you got two people, you got three opinions. So too, in our case, the Talmud lists two other opinions to the nature of this Eshel that we're talking about. According to one opinion, it wasn't a shady tree, but rather an entire orchard of fruit trees. Once again, Abraham's focus was on the guests. Wouldn't it be lovely after a long trek through the wilderness to run into a ripe piece of fruit? I think so. I'm sure you would agree. There's a third opinion about what he planted in Beersheba, that he actually built an entire five-star hotel complex, complete with a swanky lounge and a full-service restaurant. Of course, you could eat outside. But that's what we're trying to say. Again, Abraham's objective was to provide fabulous service to the weary traveler. What is the lesson to all of us? The lesson contained here is, is timeless, especially during this pandemic season. And it's not a call to join the hotel industry or the Sierra Club. Abraham represents the embodiment of kindness. He did not merely give his guests the minimal requirements for survival, tepid water, stale bread, a pinch of salt. Rather, he gave them fabulous food and displayed, my friends, tremendous, tremendous hospitality. You see, each and every one of us, by virtue of a human being, by virtue of the DNA of our parents, grandparents, great back generations, we too have inherited Abraham's attribute of kindness. Hence, we have the capacity to give of ourselves in the same way, in the same manner as Abraham. We can assist and help others not only with their vital necessities, but rather we can go beyond, far, far above and beyond the call of duty and help others in a truly limitless fashion. Now, the next concept I want to share with you, again, having in mind the eternity and the relevancy of the narratives that the Torah provides us during these weeks. The question we have to ask ourselves, we've learned how kind Abraham was and how kind we can all be. The next question is, is it a sin to argue with God? It is kind of sacrilegious to question the divine. Well, let me tell you something. This same Abraham that we're talking about, he, he did it. He did. He argued with God. But once again, not for himself, but on behalf of the people of Sodom, whom God had decided to destroy because of their wickednesses. This is also part of this week's Torah narrative. 
You see, he was the paragon of chesed, personifying kindness and compassion. Therefore, he grappled with the Almighty, attempting to negotiate a stay for the inhabitants of these notorious cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was his argument? You're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? He asked of God. Will the judge of all earth not do justice? If there are 50 righteous persons, will you spare them? 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. You all know. In the end, of course, Abraham couldn't even find a minion of righteous persons in the city. And he gives up. And now, what happens? What do we see? What does he do? The verse continues. For Avram, Shavlim, Kaimai. Abraham went back to his place. You see, having failed his valiant attempt, he acknowledges defeat and retreats to his corner. But there is an, a deeper understanding to these last words. When it says that after he, he faced this issue of arguing with God and at the end didn't get his way, Abraham goes back to his place means that he went back to his ways, to his custom. What was his custom? which was to defend the underdog, to look out for the needy and help those in trouble, even if they're not that most righteous of people. You see, Abraham refused to become delusioned by in defeat. He went right, he went right back to his ways, even though this particular attempt did not meet with success. And that's a question we must ask ourselves. We attempt we try. What happens if we lose? We hurt. We sulk. We give up. It didn't work. It's no use. It's futile. Why bother? Throw in the towel. Not Abraham. Even after what could be considered, you know, a loss, you know, he didn't give up. He stuck to his principles. He may have experienced a setback, but he would still champion the cause of justice. He would still speak out for those in peril. And he would still take his cause and his case to the highest authority in the universe. Of course, we talk about God Almighty himself. So what do we learn from all of this? Abraham, it teaches us not to lose faith, not to deviate from our chosen path or our sincerity and all our important convictions. If we believe it, it's the right thing to do, then it's the right even if there's no reward in sight. If it is right, we stick to it no matter the outcome. One of my favorite cartoon characters is good old Charlie Browns in Peanuts. In one strip that sticks in my memory, there's a storm raging outside and Charlie Brown is determined to go out and fly a kite. His friends tell him, you must be crazy. Go out and flying a kite in this weather? It'll be destroyed by the wind in no time. But in the last frame, what do we see? What do we see? We see Charlie marching out of the door, his kite firmly tucked under his arm, and the caption reads, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Powerful thoughts, my friends. So the first thing we've learned from Abraham is kindness. And not just to his own children and immediate family, but to anyone, even the wayfarer. And how did he provide his food. We have these different opinions, but the bottom line is he built something. He built something in Beersheba that provided the best, whether it was protection from the sun under the tree, whether it was the best fruits growing from the tree, or was it a hotel? And others wish to say that he also had a group, a Sanhedrin-like, like a court where people could ask questions and adjudicate differences amongst the wayfarers powerful idea of being kind and not giving up on that kindness. And here he was, lesson number two, he had gone to God to try to intercede on, on Sodom and Gomorrah and he did everything he could and God said, no, I'm not doing it. You would think he would sulk, disappear, give up, lose faith. No, he just kept on going. As I'm saying, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. He maintained that perspective of compassion and love and kindness as he always did. He didn't give up. So do we believe in our principles of faith because of expediency? 
Are we virtuous because we believe it is the way to a good life? Are we waiting for the big payoff to our good behavior? What happens when we don't see it? Do we become frustrated? Disillusioned? Do we become angry at God? Some people become religious for the wrong reasons. They're looking for some magical solution in the problems of life. And when the problems don't disappear as quickly or as magically as they expected, they give up on their, their lifestyle. It didn't work. I'm out of here. Am I saying it right? Well, virtue is its own reward. Sleeping better at night because our conscience is clear is also part of the deal. So as in the words of the sages, the reward for doing a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. So our founding fathers remind us that we got to do what we have to do, regardless of the outcome. You keep on trucking. Whether we see the fruits of our labors or not, if it's the right thing to do, then we just carry on doing it. And then, of course, what goes through my mind is during these very difficult times and we have every good reason to be this and to be that, to be the elections and backwards and the forwards and the, uh, you know, the COVID. And come on, let's just stick to being, so to speak, the true children of Abraham of just doing what we have to do, remaining calm, remaining focused, continue, because at the end of the day, all of us know whether you voted for this party or that party, the ultimate party is the fact that we all have it. Every human being has a divine mission, and that is to bring into this world goodness and kindness, exactly like Abraham did. Now, another important thing that I've been thinking about is how we spend our money is usually a pretty good barometer of where our priorities lie. And this applies equally whether the money is plentiful or scarce. Let's look at, again, after the birth of Isaac, his half-brother, Ishmael, behaves threateningly towards him and Sarah finds it necessary to ask Abraham to banish Ishmael from the family home. Right? So together with his mother, Hagar, they wander in the desert. Soon they're out of water. The Torah tells us, and the water in the leather flask was finished and she cast off the boy beneath one of the bushes. So let me ask you, what would you call a typical, you know, uh, obvious question? Maybe you, stupid question. If the flask is empty, why throw away the child? What well, the, the sentence is in Genesis, and the water in the flask was finished, and she cast off the boy beneath one of the bushes. Why throw away the child? Throw away the empty flask. It would appear then that when our food supply is depleted and the finances is in short supply, the first thing, ones, uh, the first ones to suffer may be the children. The bank, low, the bank balance is low. How can we even think of a Jewish day school education, sending our children to a Jewish day school or a Hebrew school or yeshiva? The tuition f- uh, fees are so expensive. Instead of denying ourselves creature comforts, we deem non-negotiable. What do we do? We sacrifice our children's Jewish upbringing in the name of economics. I can't afford it. This is not for me. It's like the old story of the Jewish mother who came from Eastern Europe to join her son in America and was horrified to see that he'd shaved off his beard and he took off his yarmulke. What happened to you, my uncle? She said, Mamala, America is not a shtetl. And when she saw him uh, going to a typical uh, work on the Sabbath, again, he told her, America is different. When she opened up the fridge and discovered all the creepy kinds of creepy things she never saw in the Jewish kitchen, again he explained that America was not the same as back home. Eventually, when it was getting too much, she said, Yankala, tell, tell your old mother the truth. Are you still circumcised? You see, it's not only an old shtetl story. It's something that we must be thinking about in terms of priority, of how we do things. Yes, the limited resources, we've got to make choices, we've got to make uh, priorities. But what, what do we cut off? It's certainly during this period of time when the word essential, essential workers, where we find ourselves becoming essential to our family, what is really essential to us? You know, what, 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 what is really something that we, we care about and care about most? And... It's very important for us to bear in mind how important the Jewish education is to ourselves, but to our children and grandchildren. And uh, how important we must be. We have to be extremely careful 
of knowing what what it's all about, what what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. Children need stability in an environment with a healthy value system. It's very important to keep in mind that it is important not to come across as controlling, allowing our children space. But the purpose of that space must be filled with an environment, a home, like we're discussing beforehand, a home that's filled like Abraham. When a child sees a home that's filled with priority of helping others, having guests in one's home, supporting charity causes, that leaves an impression on the child. That tells that child that priority in this home is the performance of good deeds that help other people. And that comes through education. That comes through a personal example of what we're doing in, in our world. Because children, no matter how tempting or secure other seemingly greener pastures may be, the way we, our children, must spiritually you know, secure, have that kind of security to thrive and to survive is, my friends, is the way we conduct ourselves and what our priorities are. If our conversation, the children only hear, is about what kind of car or uh, landscaping or vacation, all those things, that's exactly what we're teaching them. That, that Those are the priorities of life. But if our families, our children and grandchildren see what a Friday night looks, Shabbos candles are lit. We see... We're careful about not only what comes out of our mouth, but what goes into our mouth in terms of kosher food. Then, then, then we're actually living a life where if from time to time the bottle is empty, we don't throw away the child. So last week we read how Abraham received his marching orders, Lech Lecha, to leave from his land, from his birthplace, from his father's house, to the land that God was shown. So here he was, leaving all his familiar comfort zones, and traveling to unknown destinations. Eventually, it would become known as the land of Israel. And Abraham as the one who whom it was originally promised. At the time, however, Abraham probably had no idea where he was going. But orders are orders. He went faithfully. In the end, Abraham's great trek would be the fulfillment of his calling as the father of monotheism. He would take on the entire world pagans of the time and succeed beyond his own wildest dreams. By the way, I think we take our biblical giants too much for granted. We fail to appreciate the enormity of Abraham's contribution to civilization. What he did was nothing less than single-handedly change the mindset of the world. Believing in one invisible creator was a cultural shock to the idol worshippers of the day. This achievement made Abraham not only the founding father, but also the father of all monotheistic faiths of the world. No wonder a recent study of, of history's 100 most influential people ranked Abraham way on top, far above the faith founders, other uh, faith founders, and even ahead of Madonna, Brittany, and all the other, uh, you know, Bill Gates, etc. So according to our sages, this journey to the unknown was the first of many tests of faith that the Almighty would impose upon Abraham. Yet in the final test, we should read about on Rosh Hashanah and also on yesterday's portion is considered the supreme test. What was that? The Akedah, the binding of Isaac, the near sacrifice of the son he waited a century, literally, a hundred years to have. And that generates far more coverage in the Torah, in our prayers and in our writings. Why should this be the case? Right? The first test of Lech Lecha had a universal impact left his family, left, and he stood up for monotheism. But the binding of Isaac was just between himself, his son, and God. Somewhere on some secluded mountaintop, far above public security, a personal drama was playing out. The journey of Abraham, on the other hand, had almost a global audience. Surely, this universal test should be considered more important than the personal test between him and his son. The answer is 
that before we can undertake a universal mission to mankind, we must first understand our personal relationship to God. Or to put it simply, before you can change the world, you have to know who you are. If you don't know yourself, if you don't recognize your own personal spiritual mission, how can you hope to influence the broader society? As our sages tell us, famous words, perfect yourself before you seek to perfect others. Obviously, this is not to say that we should not try and teach others until we are perfect. Who is perfect? What it does suggest is that if we hope to have an impact on others, our call must resonate as authentic and genuine. How can we make an impression on others if we're not credible individual ourselves? A good salesman believes in his product, even if he had to talk himself into believing it. So the legendary Hillel tells us in the Ethics of the Fathers, do not judge your fellow until you've reached his place. And an alternative understanding interpretation is what is Hillel saying? That in order to judge any person accurately, one should first establish what kind of reputation that individual enjoys in his own makom, in his own city and home. Is there not some truth to Jackie Mason's jesting at the Jewish husband who is a big moving shaker all over town, but who, as soon as he walks through the door of his own house, becomes a henpecked shl- shlemiel? Years ago, I came across a one line that had a profound impact on me personally. Every rabbi has only one sermon the way he lives his life. It's all too true. You know, we can preach from today until next Yom Kippur, but if we don't walk the the talk and live the game we purport to play, we will leave our audiences unmoved. The most eloquent orators will fail to make an impression if their listeners know that their message is hollow and isn't backed up by genuine personal commitment. So while the story of Abraham's journey in universal mission appears in the Torah, and comes chronologically before the final test. In essence, the Akedah, when he privately went with his son, that test, the near sacrifice of his own son, that reigned supreme. Not only because it was the most difficult, but because our personal commitment and integrity always formed the moral basis for our mission in the world. And at the end of the day, only these validate the person in his or her message. And that really is the acid test for all of us. Another important idea that I'd like to share with you today, and I do appreciate I take the opportunity to thank all of our, all those listening to us and those who listen to us at any time. I really uh, am humbled by your presence and your commitment to join us each week. And I do send a very special thank you to the NASA Community College and its radio station, uh, for continuing these programs, despite all the limitations, social distancing and everything else throughout this COVID season. Thank you. Thank you to the station manager and to every my engineer, and to everybody there to make sure that our messages are, uh, were able to come through thick and thin. So uh, I want to say thank you to Sean and to Kim. Thank you. Let me conclude Something which is holy is also protected, and to a certain extent, hidden. The holies of holies, which was the innermost chamber of the temple, was the most sacred place in the world. One, one way its holiness is expressed is through the fact that nobody ever went there except for the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur. Similarly, more familiar to us, is the Torah scroll, its holiness. It's kept in an ark behind a curtain, and when the Torah is taken out of the ark, this is felt to be a special occasion. Everybody in the synagogue stands up. It, it is still within a mantle, but only when it's brought to the bima is the mantle removed. If the Torah scroll is carried to another location, it's usually wrapped in a talus, an extra covering expressing its sanctity. So here we have this week telling us something about womanhood, something very relevant to our times. The womanhood is sacred and has special spiritual powers also tells us that feminine modesty has a profound aspect of human life, making a woman beloved to a husband. A lot of the problems that we're reading about and hearing about and reading about is all to do with the lack of modesty. Torah tells us about three angels who visit Abraham. 
they disguised as travelers. And, he asked, and they asked Abraham, where's your wife? Where's Sarah? He answers, she's in the tent. Rashi, the commentary, discloses why. Uh, I mean, you come into the house, you don't see her, so you know she's, you know, she's not there. What, what, what was the purpose of asking his, uh, Abraham where his wife was? As we know, Sarah was very beautiful. By affirming that she's in the tent, rather than standing in all her beauty before these three visiting men, this was a subtle hint that Sarah of her great modesty. Why should the angels wish to hint to Sarah's modesty? So Rashi explains, in order to make her beloved to her husband. Modesty expresses inner beauty and hints at the deep spirituality in holiness, which is the inner nature of womanhood. In certain ways, the woman represents the Shekhinah, the divine presence in this world. The quality of the feminine is the point where the physical and the sacred join. The angels have come to tell Abraham and Sarah that Sarah was about to, to bear a child. Perhaps the hint to her modesty, thus making her yet more beloved to her husband, is part of that mission. So modesty is an ideal which is central to Jewish life. And as we see today, it's becoming that much more important to recognize the space and the role and the modesty. It affects not only clothes, but also speech and behavior. As defined by Jewish law, modesty concerns men as well as women. But in the popular consciousness, it's especially relevant to the women. Modesty expresses the inner beauty and the spiritual power of womanhood. Therefore, the ideal modesty does not mean that women are to be hidden from society. No, no. According to the sages, Sarah provides a key example of a woman who taught others, gave spiritual inspiration to the people, to the women, and to the people and the women of her time. Modesty is a fine value, but is not taken to the extreme apparent as we see in some societies today. Later on, we read, ultimately, Abraham is told to listen to his wife because she has the divine spirit within her. Therefore, the Torah highlights several qualities of our great-great-grandmother Sarah, which was um, modesty, inner beauty, power to inspire others, and holiness. And these are qualities that she bequeathed to her daughters, to her, to her family, through the generations, all the way to our time. So here we have, wrapping this up, the importance of recognizing the key role of both our patriarch, Abraham, and our matriarch, Sarah, provides and through from them all the way to ourselves today we have all these abilities for inner beauty power to inspire others power to be considerate of others strangers helping them providing them with with um, all they need as they travel through life may the almighty bless us with good news and let's all join together and say god bless america One, two, three, four.